Fear, like trauma, can scar us in different ways. For me, I was driven deep into my head, made reclusive, fearing the man that I was meant to love, my father Morris. From a young age, I looked for escape, immersing myself in the romance of superstition and a world of make-belief, yet seeking inspiration in my family's fossil dust. Generations repressed into silence. Emotion seen as a weakness that had to be suppressed. A family from a fading England. Priests and politicians. Even a prime minister. And young officers in the battlefields of oblivion that claimed first my grandmother's two brothers and then her beloved son. A family upon whose tree dragons writhed, and where humour rarely smiled. I was once told a story. A man was scattering sand from a bag that he carried. Why are you scattering that sand? An onlooker asked. It's magic sand to keep dragons away. The man replied. But there are no dragons here, remarked the onlooker. You see, said the man, it works. Like the man who scattered sand, we all have a need to believe in something, to escape the reality of both the present and the memory of which we cannot speak, even to those we love. I never felt that I knew my father other than as a man of silence. A silence that I too learn today. When Morris did speak, it was of simple things, of the weather and of animals. By learning, he was an engineer during the Second World War, the builder of railways and bridges. By 1941, he was the youngest officer to hold the rank of Major in the British Army, as the Allies pushed south from India into Burma and Siam, which are today called Myanmar and Thailand. But oh yes, my father indeed had his dragons. Seldom speaking of wartime memories, apart from mentioning the animals. Men who caught snakes with their teeth. Naughty monkeys, he told me, lived in golden temples. Then there was that which he did not talk about. What was it that closed my father's mind until his death? in April 2007. Amongst his things, I found some papers and some photographs. My need to understand 
took me and my new family to Thailand's border country. Here, Morris had spoken of elephant journeys in a jungle where roads had no place until a railway came. The one on which I am travelling, beside the River Kwai. The Japanese drove north, up through Siam, to confront the Allies by building this railway. Later, this line was to be their means of retreat. Using primitive tools and under great hardship, 30,000 Allied prisoners of war and over 100,000 Thai forced labourers constructed this 415 kilometre track between Thailand and Myanmar for the Japanese military in just 14 months. A project estimated to take five years. They call it a death railway. The Kwai Bridge is a sombre place. Amongst his papers, Morris noted bad times when the cholera hit. With the Thai labourers drinking just river water and having no medical attention, 80,000 died in the jungle. The Allied prisoners had to go out, gather them up, put them in piles and burn them. Of the Allied prisoners of war, almost half died. Those that did survive were carried out in an operation in which my father was a part. Work for which he was awarded the MBE. More than 7,000 of the prisoners of war rest here in the Kanchanaburi War Cemetery. Among them are friends of my father. Only three Thai graves are known of. The thousands are perhaps remembered in the temples with monkeys. And what of me in my time of unknowing? As a child, I'd escaped my father's dark silences. Nature was my escape. An ash tree was my sanctuary. Age hollowed, it was the place of my early imaginings. Imaginings to which I returned childlike as a means of coping with my new fears and trauma when my heart was replaced with that of a mourned soul. Transplanted. I was caught up in my grandmother Mary's stories.
As a young woman, Mary had travelled far, independent, riding across North America on horseback was something remarkable for an English woman 100 years ago. She must have learnt much before her heart was broken by war and dragons began to gnaw. The world is so full of stories. They're the tenets of belief. Stories existed long before the Vikings settled here and the three spinners of Norse mythology sat beneath the giant ash tree of his drizzle, the world tree, and began to weave the destiny of the world. These spinners that visited a baby's birth determined the infant's future. Caesarean born of a mother who died young from a failed heart, I ponder my own fate. The fate that gave me another heart. Inexorable, as the Norse believed. The invisible given form by what the eyes saw. As four deer ran the branches of his drizzle to represent the four winds, so those winds now catch my breath by beauty, a beauty conjuring spirit. I remember the dog that howled. Dogs, Mary said, have the power of seeing death as it approaches. She'd heard them howl before. And when the owl screeched, so the sick would surely die. These things were told to a child who lived within his head. But I didn't die. And I realised that my grandmother wasn't always right. Hers was a time of sympathy between people and other living creatures that were part of their lives. A fading England becoming distant from me where man needs reasons and finds consolation in superstition's prayers. I knew that there had been heart magic, not the magic that comes from modern medicine, the medicine that gave me a heart transplant, but the magic of superstition. Placing a sheep's heart stuck with pins up a chimney would prevent a witch from entering the house. A charm powerful against the forces of evil, drawn from far off memory, when the sacrifice was ritual. Upon Exmoor, trees make mockery of the lifespan of man. So man erected stones to resemble trees. This weather-worn stone is ancient. My tree of dragons. From a time man worshipped the tree, root reaching to the dragon earth mother. Healing was in the hands of the shaman, who removed intrusive spirits and retrieved stolen souls. And I ask questions. Heart transplanted and mind are fearful. Does the spirit of my donor need retrieving from me? Can the soul of my birth heart be returned by medicine of the mind? A journey to retrieve that which is mine. The healing gifts of the shaman have existed before the Norse spoke of the sisters Erd, Verdandi and Skald, the three spinners who wove fate beneath his drizzle. A world of spirit behind a closed eyelid dark. I see dragons as creatures of my mind's imaginings, given life by the stories I write my escape from yearning for the soul part that is missing, 
cut away, leaving body fading fears. My make-believe exists as a world in parallel, yet dipping to touch the here and now, where heart tears dry and heart laughter volcano erupts without self-consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> Hopelessly inadequate for body ills, witches' charms and fairy spells are a most powerful medicine for the mind. The Green Man's Daughter, the mischievous carer of the creatures that run and creep, weave and fly, enchanted the worlds that the tree root enters and where the treetop points. She could spin the wind music and beseech protection from the Oak King and the Beech Queen. From the ash, she'd ask for wisdom, and from the yew, she'd draw knowledge of things meant to be. She knew the Boggles homes and the holly holes where the pigsies gathered gold. So this has become my world. A world where a priest can be touched by a sea fairy. More than ever, I remember a place of flashing lights and life-supporting tubes and the dog that howled as I turned a deaf ear to the screech of owls. Beside the Chow Praya River, Thailand is now in fast grow. This urban carelessness leaves children forgotten and left to seek sanctuary in their own dragon dreams. As a new generation meets face to face with terror. On a train journey alongside the River Kwai, I too found silence and came to understand that some things are best kept to oneself, like the deaths of friends or even a heart transplant. <laughs> 